Welcome to episode one of this read-along book club of Ted Chang's Stories of Your Life and Others. I actually read Stories of Your Life, the single short story in this book, prior to seeing the movie. I was kind of let down by it, honestly, um, as I am to a degree with these two stories, these very first two stories, but I, I won't spoil all my thoughts quite yet. I'll try to distill things down at the end of each story and, and obviously give my, my commentary throughout the reading. But let me know right now, how are you feeling about these two? Do you think this... Uh, collection is worthy of all the praise that it's gotten? Or do you think it is an overrated sci-fi masterpiece? Okay, well, let us move into the text itself and start with the Tower of Babylon. Hilalim had spent all of his life in Elam, and he knew Babylon only as a buyer of Elam's copper. And Hilalim and the other miners, they traveled over land, and none of them had ever seen the tower before. I should have mentioned this very first paragraph here describes just the, the the size of this tower, how massive it is. That's kind of an odd way to start a story, but again, the, the writing style here is is very different than a normal narrative. It's somewhat distant. We have a POV character being Halalim here, but uh, I didn't really feel much connection to him. A line as thin as a strand of flax wavering in the shimmering air, rising up from the crust of mud that was Babylon itself. And as they approached the city gates, the tower appeared more massive than anything Halalim had ever imagined. All of them walked with their heads tilted back, squinting in the sun. Halalim's friend Nanny prodded him with an elbow, awestruck. We're to climb that to the top? Going up to dig, it seems. Unnatural. Unnatural indeed. Belly shouted, We are the miners summoned from the land of Elam. The gatekeepers were delighted, and one called back, You are the ones who are to dig through the vault of heaven? We are. The entire city was celebrating. The festival had begun eight days ago when the last of the bricks were sent on their way and would last two more. Every day and every night, the city rejoiced, danced, feasted. Each morning, a crew began its ascent. They climbed for four days, transferred their loads to the next crew of pullers, and returned to the city with empty carts on the fifth. In the evening, Halalim and the other Elamite miners sat upon clay stools before a long table laden with food. Nanny said, Someone told me that the bricklayers who work at the top of the tower wail and tear the hair when the brick is dropped because it will take four months to replace, but no one takes notice when a man falls to his death. Is that true? One of the more talkative polars, Lugatam, shook his head. Oh no, that is only a story. There is a continuous caravan of bricks going up to the tower. Thousands of bricks reach to the top each day. However, there is something they value more than the man's life. A trowel. Why a trowel? If a bricklayer drops his trowel, he can do no work until a new one is brought up. For months he cannot earn the food that he eats, so he must go into debt. But if a man falls, and the trowel remains, men are secretly relieved. The next one to drop his trowel can, can pick up the extra one and continue working without incurring debt. Halalim was appalled, and obviously so, how a, how a mere shovel can be uh, more valuable than human life. That cannot be true. Why not have spare trowels brought up? And surely the loss of a man means a serious delay unless they have the extra man at the top who is skilled with bricklaying. Without such a man, they must wait for another one to climb from the bottom. All of the pullers roared with laughter. We cannot fool this one. So you'll begin your climb once the festival is over? Yes, I I've heard we will be joined by miners from our western land. Yes, they come from a land called Egypt. They quarry stone. Merchants who have traveled to Egypt say that they have stone ziggurats and temples built with limestone and granite, huge blocks of it, and they carve giant statues. The royal architects believe such stone workers may be useful when you reach the vault of heaven. Then you Elamites will ascend alone. I envy you that you will touch the vault of heaven. And the next morning, Halalim went to see the tower. According to all the tales, the tower was constructed to have a mighty strength that no ziggurat possessed. It was made of baked brick all the way through when ordinary ziggurats were made sun-dried mud brick, having baked brick only for the facing. The bricks were set in the bitumen mortar, which soaked into the fired clay, forming a bond as strong as the bricks themselves. Elalim thought of the story told to him in childhood. How man had thus realized the extent of the earth and felt it to be small, and desired to see what lay beyond its borders, all the rest of Yahweh's creation. How they looked skyward and wondered about Yahweh's dwelling place. And how many centuries ago there began the construction of the tower, a pillar to heaven, a stair that men might ascend to, see the works of Yahweh. So we're very familiar with this biblical story, the Tower of Babel. Uh, I read it actually recently, uh, thinking that it was going to be a little bit more immaculate than it was in, in, the, in the work, but 
It's a very short story, very short story. Here is, is a very uh, a longer representation of, of potentially what could have been. He had been excited when the Babylonians came to Elam looking for miners. His senses rebelled, insisting that nothing should stand so high. Should he climb such a thing? Hmm. He keeps questioning himself, um, asking uh, again, uh, thinking of this old story, and uh, should he be dabbling in such things? And, well, we know the answer to that. But on the morning of the climb, the second platform was covered edge to edge with stout two-wheeled carts and managed in rows. Their foreman had also ordered a number of carts to be loaded with wood and sheaves of reeds. From where did this wood come from? I saw no forest after we left Elam. There is a forest of trees to the north, which was planted when the tower was begun. When they began the tower, the architects knew that far more wood would be needed to fuel the kilns that could be found on the plain. So they had a forest of trees planted. Soon all the men were paired up and matched in the cart. Remember, said Louitam, stay about ten cubits behind the cart in front of you. The man on the right does all the pulling when you turn corners, and you'll switch every hour. Do you sing when you mine? asked Louitam. Uh, when the stone is soft, said Nanny. Sing one of your mining songs, then. The call went down to the other miners, and before long, the entire crew was singing. So everyone is happy, uh, cheerily, singing as they are making their way to the top to reach the vault of heaven. Little do they know what horrors, uh, maybe horrors is a strong word, what uh, vistas are going to uh, dazzle their minds. As the shadows shortened, they ascended higher and higher. The city of Babylon was an intricate pattern of closely set streets and buildings. Dazzling with gypsum whitewash, Helen was again pulling on the right-hand rope near the edge when he heard the same, some shouting. What's happening down there? He had called to Lagadam behind him. One of your fellow miners fears the height. And indeed, I think for me, Britain, you also mentioned this, because I hope for, hopefully you're watching this, so I'm going to talk to you directly. But uh, uh, Britain on the Discord, he mentioned that um, this kind of played with his fear of heights and I'll agree, while I didn't find the, the, the writing very immersive, you know, I didn't feel like I was really there with these characters for the entirety of it, there are descriptions of these heights, particularly when they reach the midpoint where uh, uh, up is and down are kind of the same, right? You're, you're just kind of stuck in this weird limbo, this weird space that has no relation to the ground or the sky. And, and I felt that, that, that vertigo as well. How do you feel yourself about the height? I feel nothing. But he glanced at Nanny and they both knew the truth. You feel nervousness in your palms, don't you? Whispered Nanny. Alalam rubbed his hands at the coarse fibers of the rope and nodded. Do you think we will too fear the height when we climb further? We are merely unaccustomed. We will have months to grow used to the height. By the time we reach the top of the tower, we will wish we were taller. No, said Nanny. I don't think I'll wish to pull this any further. And they both laughed. In the evening, they ate a meal of barley and onions and lentils and slept inside narrow corridors that penetrated into the body of the tower. And so sore were their legs. But now, looking down the side, it turned Halalam's knees to water. Aside from the soreness in the miner's legs, the second day was similar to the first. And on the third day, the miner's legs had not improved it. Halalam felt like a crippled old man. Only on the fourth day did their legs feel better, and they were pulling their original loads again. Take care of your cart. It has climbed the entire height of the tower more times than any man. Do you envy the cart too? asked Nanny. No, because every time it reaches the top, it must come all the way back down. I could not bear to do that. When the second crew stopped at the end of the day, the puller of the cart behind Halalam and Nanny came over to show them something. His name was Kuda. You have never seen the sun at sight. Come, look. When the sun is about to set, look down at the side of the tower. This was kind of cool here. Uh, when the sun sinks behind the peaks of the mountains to the west, it grows dark down in the plains of Shinar. Yet here we are higher than the mountaintops, so we can still see the sun. The shadows of the mountains mark the beginning of night. Night falls on the earth before it does here. You can see the night travel up the tower from the ground up to the sky. Now! And for the first time he knew night for what it was. The shadow of the earth itself cast against the sky. That's one interesting thing about this book is it kind of really puts things in perspective. There's a lot of ordinary things, uh, particularly night, for instance, that we, 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 we know what it is, but we don't ever consider it. And, and I, I love fiction for that reason. One of the many reasons I love fiction points you to the obvious. It, it's nice to remember sometimes, remember the ordinary things. I think it just helps kind of, um, you know, give you perspective in life. After climbing for two more days, Halalam had grown more accustomed to the height. He asked Kuda, 
The tower seems to widen further up. How, how can that be? Look more closely. There are wooden balconies reaching out from the sides. They have soil spread on them so people can grow vegetables. At this height, water is scarce. The water it dries in the air as it falls, of course. By the end of the next day, they reach the level of the balcony. So this is kind of cool. There's communities, right, on this gigantic tower. So it's not just like a, a, you know, a long bridge. It's, it's like an ascent waypoints along the way. People who actually exist here. By the end of the next day, they had reached the level of the balconies. When it came time for the evening meal, all the carts were set down and food and other goods were taken off to be used by the people here. After dinner, he asked Kud and his family, Have any of you ever visited Babylon? You have no desire to actually walk on the earth. Kud shrugged, uh, We live on the road to heaven. All the work we do here is to extend it further. When we leave the tower, we will take the upward ramp, not the downward. As the miners ascended, in the course of time, there came the day when the tower appeared to be the same when it looked upward and downward from the ramp's edge. This was what I was talking about is <laughs> when you're up so high. It reminded me of this video. I'll put a screenshot up here or maybe a clip, but there's this guy who gets paid $20,000, I think, every time. He's got to change his little light bulb at the top of this 1,500-foot um, tower, and he has to manually climb up there. I don't know why they don't have a better way to do this, but anyway, he gets paid uh, twenty grand or so uh, twice a year to do this thing. Uh, it's incredibly dangerous. Um, you can see the curvature of the earth, uh, how, how high this guy is, and it's, it's just insane. And I, I kind of kept that in mind, even though we know that this is incredibly more uh, just high than, than he is. But to look up or down was frightening, for the reassurances of con continuity were gone. They were no longer part of the ground. And this is one thing to think about. I, I kind of think about this when I think about a astronauts, too. When there's no gravity, you kind of lose your bearings to a degree, right? up and down are, are kind of meaningless even side to side because you don't have any any point to orient yourself right we're so used to uh being grounded uh with gravity and, and knowing what is down what is up feeling the pressure feeling all of those things um, i can only imagine that still having that gravity and that sense of direction to a degree um, or at least knowing it because you are still more or less earthbound has to be uh, quite a, a scary thing to see right here. There were moments during this section of the climb when Halalim despaired, feeling displaced and estranged from the world. It was as if the earth had rejected him for his faithlessness while heaven disdained to accept him. So that's a nice uh, reflective moment um, right at the midpoint, right? He's having kind of this um, midpoint revelation right when he's at the midpoint of this tower. So I like that little bit of... Uh, hidden uh, fictional craft there. Then they approached the sun. It was the summer season. No families lived in this section of the tower, nor were any of the balconies, since the heat was enough to roast barley. They started out earlier and earlier each morning to gain more darkness for when they pulled. During the day, they tried to sleep naked and sweating in the hot breeze. Eventually, they passed above the sun's level. Crazy. And I think this is a, an apt time to talk about. Um, she is okay, I guess. She is a, a Discord user on my server. And uh, she, she did some Googling and, and found what does the uh, the tower look like? What is the world look like? I should, or what does the world look like? And I'll probably throw a screenshot of what that looks like up here, or at least what, um, you know, whoever answered that question thinks it looks like. But uh, again, more Babylonian lore kind of thrown into the mix of the story. Now the light of the day shone upward. Mind blown. The sun, the sun is below us now. But we know that... Uh, the way our uh, solar system is constructed, that is entirely impossible. But the way this um, this ancient Babylonian world was constructed with the uh, the concentric circles, um, this seems to be possible. But then they drew near the level of the stars. Wow, even in space. During the day, the sky was a much paler blue than it appeared from the earth, a sign they were nearing the vault. One day, Nanny came to him hurriedly and said, a star has hit the tower. No, not now. It was a long time ago, more than a century. One of the tower's dwellers is telling the story. His grandfather was there. They went inside the corridors and saw several miners seated around the wizened old man. It lodged itself in the bricks about half a leg above here. You can still see the scar it left. It's like a giant pockmark. What happened to the star? It burned and sizzled and was too bright to look upon. Men considered prying it out so that it might resume its course, but it was too hot to approach closely. And they dared not quench it. After weeks, it cooled to a knotted mass of black heaven metal, as large as a man could wrap his arms around. And this is when we find out that the metal could not be melted for casting, so it was worked by hammering when heated red amulets were made from it. And there was a silence. Then one of the miners said, 
I have never heard of this in the stories of the tower. It was a transgression, something not spoken. I'm not sure what the significance of that is, but as they climbed higher up to the tower, the sky grew lighter in color until one morning Halalam woke up and stood at the edge and yelled from shock. What had before seemed a pale sky now appeared to be white ceiling stretched far above their heads. They were close enough to now perceive the vault of heaven, to see it as a solid carapace, enclosing all the sky. All of Halalam's senses were disoriented by the sight of it. Sometimes when he looked at the vault, he felt as the world had flipped around somehow, and if he lost his footing, he would fall upward to meet it. So interesting to think about this is when you are so high, you are so high that everything is inverted, and so he's going to fall up instead of falling down. But their ascent grew slower instead of faster as their form and belly had expected. The sight of their vault inspired unease rather than eagerness. Perhaps men were not meant to live in such a place. If their own natures restrained them from approaching heaven too closely, then men should remain on the earth. Those two lines really encapsulate what the story means to me. It's that we are constantly trying to um, progress. We're, we're trying to develop. It reminds me of a book called Civilized to Death, which was probably the, one of the most eye-opening books I've ever read or read in a very, very long time. And it's talking about how our civilization, our progress, all of these things, we like to say that we are better for it, right? We are better for all of these things. But really, they've just kind of destroyed us. He's an anthropologist who wrote this, and he's done extensive research, um, met tons of hunter-gatherer tribes and stuff, and, and just compared what it was like to uh, live that way versus this way. And he has an answer for everything. It's an incredibly interesting book, and um, one that really makes you think about our place in the cosmos, so to speak, and, and, and that is that we, we belong on earth, and, and unfortunately, we are pretty much hindered by our bi biology. We can't uh, outsmart uh, millions or billions of years of evolution. We can get kind of close, but I think if you look at the state of the world right now, the state of our health, the state of well-being, all of that stuff, um, mental health, uh, I think you'll understand that um, all of this progress has really been a detriment to us. But the miners gazed up at the most awesome scene ever glimpsed by men. Far below them lay a tapestry of soil and sea, veiled by mist, rolling out in all directions to the limits of the eye. Just above them hung the roof of the world itself, the absolute upper demarcation of the sky, guaranteeing their vantage point as the highest possible. Here was as much of creation as could be apprehended at once. And then at the top, the bricks were laid. Here worked the bricklayers, the men smeared with bit bitumen, who uh, mixed mortar and, and deftly set the heavy bricks with the absolute precision. They were nearing the end of their task. Finally, and after four months of climbing, the miners were ready to begin theirs. The Egyptians arrived shortly afterwards. They had pole carts filled with dolerite hammers, bronze tools, and wooden wedges. The vault itself remained just above the man's outstretched fingertips. It felt smooth and cool when one left up to touch it. It seemed to make the fine-grained white granite unmarred and utterly featureless, and therein lay the problem. Long ago, Yahweh had released the deluge, unleashed waters from both below and above. Now men saw the vault closely, but there were no sluice gates discernible. They squinted at the surface in all directions, but no openings, no windows, no seams interrupted the granite plain. Indeed, if a sluice gate had been visible, they would have had a risk of breaking it open and emptying a, a reservoir. So they're worried that the floods of Yahweh are going to come down upon their heads. Surely Yahweh will not wash away the tower, argued Curduso, one of the bricklayers. If the tower were sacrilege, Yahweh would not have destroyed it earlier yet. In all of the centuries we've been working, we have never seen the slightest sign of Yahweh's displeasure. Yahweh will drain any reservoir before he penetrates it. If Yahweh looked upon this venture with such favor, there would already be a stairway ready-made for us to the vault, countered Eluti and Elamite. We labor for our loves of Yahweh. We have done so for other lives, and so have our fathers for generations back, men as righteous as we could not be judged harshly. Did men truly choose the correct path when they opted to live their lives away from the soil from which they were shaped? That's exactly what I was talking about. I have conferred with Senmut and the Egyptians, and he has shown me designs which they have employed to seal the tombs of their kings. I believe that our methods can provide us with safety when we begin digging. And the priest sacrificed the ox and the goat in a ceremony in which many sacred words were spoken, and much intent incense was burned, and the miners began work. With the wood they had brought, a bonfire was built below the chosen point of the vault, fed steadily for a day. They could then break the stone into large pieces, which fell heavily onto the tower. In this manner, they could progress the better part of a cubit for each day the fire burned. The tunnel did not rise straight up, but an angle staircase takes so that they could build a ramp of steps up from the tower to meet it. And with a sliding stone to hold back the waters, it was safe for the miners to continue tunneling. They broke into a reservoir, and the waters of the heaven began pouring down into the tunnels. 
they would break the bricks one by one and the stone would slide down until it rested into the recess in the floor, utterly blocking the doorway. So they have a failsafe for um, <laughs> accidentally breaking the reservoir, the vault of heaven. Thus the miners worked extending the tunnel on and on. They built other sliding door rooms so that the only uppermost segment of the tunnel would be flooded if they penetrated reservoirs. There we go. For years the labor continued. The miners lived there in the borders of heaven. Some married and raised children. Few ever set foot on the earth again. That's interesting to think about. I mean, to me, this, this entire story, like I said, it's a metaphor for space travel, like what we're trying to do right now, what we're obsessed with doing right now. And, and, and to think that um, someday there will be humans that aren't even born on Earth and never experience Earth, that's pretty mind-blowing. With a wet cloth wrapped around his face, Elalem climbed down from the wooden steps on a stone, having just fed some more wood to the bonfire at the tunnel's end. Then there was a distant sound of shattering, the sound of a mountain of stone being split open, and then a steadily growing roar, and then a torrent of water came rushing down the tunnel. They had hit a reservoir. Yahweh's punishment had come, a second deluge. He stood up and saw these two fellow miners just noticing him. They stood in front of the stone, already blocked the exit. Are the others coming? shouted Yahuni with hope. We may be able to move the block. There are no others, answered Halalam. Can they push us from the other side? They cannot hear us. The three of them stood in the rising water, praying desperately, but Halalam knew it was in vain. His fate had come at last. Yahweh had not asked men to build the tower or to pierce the vault. The decision to build it belonged to men alone, and they would die in this endeavor, just as they did in any of their earthbound tasks. Their righteousness could not save them from the consequences of their deeds. The water reached their chest. Let us ascend. So they are just waiting to die. The water rose and bore them up until Alalam could reach up with his hands and touch the ceiling. The giant fissure from which the waters gushed forth was right next to him. Only a tiny pocket of air remained. Halalam shouted, When this chamber is filled, we can swim heavenward. So he's trying to swim to heaven right now. Helpless, he was perhaps floating in still water, perhaps swept furiously by a current. All he felt was numbing cold. Never did he see any light. Then he was slammed into stone again. His hands felt a fissure on the surface. He was drowning, and the blackness around him entered his lungs. But suddenly the walls opened out away from him. He was being carried along by a rushing stream of water. He felt air above the water, and then he felt no more. Halalam awoke with his face pressed against the stone. He could see nothing, but he could feel water near his hands. He rolled over and groaned. Time passed, and finally he could stand. With torn fingertips, he felt his way along the floor until it rose up and became a wall. He found the water's source, a large opening in the floor. He found a place where the floor rose in a slope. Halalam crawled, having no idea how much time had passed. And eventually he saw the light and raced to the outside. Was it the radiance of Yahweh? Could his eyes bear to see it? Minutes later, he could open them, and he saw desert. He had emerged from a cave in the foothills of some mountains and rocks and sand stretched to the horizon. A sun lay near the mountaintops behind his back. A lion moved along the horizon, and he ran to it. A figure at the end of the caravan saw him and brought, him the, entire, and brought the entire line to a stop. Alalam kept running. Finally, he returned to the man and gasped, Where is this place? Were you attacked by bandits? We are headed to Erich. Halalam stared. You would deceive me. Erich is in Shinar. I came from... I, I was in... Do you know Babylon? Oh, is that your destination? That is north of Erich. It is an easy journey between them. The tower, have you heard of it? Certainly, the pillar to heaven. It is said the men at the top are tunneling through the vault of heaven. He was in Shinar. He had returned to the earth. He had climbed above the reservoirs of heaven and arrived back at earth. Somehow, the vaults of heaven lay beneath earth. It was as if they lay against each other, though they were separated by many leagues. And then it came to him, a seal cylinder. So I'll put a picture up here too, but it's one of these things, kind of like something you'd maybe a kid would play with Play-Doh with, but they use these to uh, make this uh, this print essentially in clay. But uh, when rolled upon a tablet of soft clay, the, the carved cylinder left an imprint that formed a picture. Two figures might appear at opposite ends of the tablet, though they stood side by side on the surface of the cylinder. So this is an interesting way to depict... Uh, the world, I guess. All the world was such a cylinder. Men imagined heaven and earth as being at the ends of a tablet, with sky and stars stretched between them, yet the world was wrapped around in some fantastic way so that heaven and earth touched. It was clear now why Yahweh had not struck down the tower, had not punished men for wishing to reach beyond the bounds set for them, for the longest journey would merely return them to the place whence they'd come. Thus men would know their place. Elalam rose to his feet, his legs unsteady from awe, and sought out the caravan drivers. He would go back to Babylon, 
perhaps he would see Lugatum again. He would send word to those in the tower. He would tell them about the shape of the world. So rather than Yahweh, I thought that was interesting about the story. Rather than being punished, um, he was brought back to the square one, essentially, to zero. Um, but he, he got enlightenment, right? He, he understood the shape of the world. He understood. It was a great metaphor for just, this is where you need to be, Hilalim. This is where you need to be. This is where all of us need to be. Quit, you know, stop looking up to the stars all the time, you know. This is exactly where we came from. This is what we are made for. We are not made for any other environment, unfortunately. I feel like that's where we're going, but it may be inevitable. I used to love that idea, but I've come to, um, you know, reading books and thinking about it quite a bit. I've come to understand, which is ironic because understand is the next story in this title, in this book, but we are bound by our biology. So I'm not saying we can't exist in space. I'm sure that's where the human race will go at some point, but I can almost guarantee you we are going to be uh, far less healthy. We are not going to thrive as much in that environment because, again, that is not our native environment. So the moral of the story is enjoy your time here. Enjoy your place. Uh, go walk outside. Uh, feel the ground beneath your feet. Feel the wind in your face. Um, go sit under a tree. Read a book, maybe. But just appreciate what you have. All right, second story. Uh, this one, it kind of hit me like a bullet. Uh, when I first started reading this, it was uh, so quickly paced. I, I really was 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 sucked in to the way the writing was. Unfortunately, it became kind of a drag. I think some people all, as well on the uh, the Discord server on the book club channel have, have felt the same way. It, it just felt like a really long story that um, there was very little conflict in it, and I think that was the biggest problem. There was no ebbs and flows. Um, another thing to note is this story is told in present tense which gives it um, uh, more of a, a faster feeling, right? More, more momentum, I guess. But the, the, the downside, or, or I feel like the shortcoming of the story and the way it was written is that uh, this gentleman um, is progressing. I think his name's Leon, right? Uh, he's progressing very, very quickly in intelligence. And you'd think the writing would, would, would reflect that because it's in first person, right? You think he'd start off sounding more or less normal, and then as things uh, progressed, he might speak differently. And that kind of does happen toward the end, especially when they're speaking in, in weird little code brackets. But even the prose itself, I felt like, was going to get more abstract. And it does to a degree, but it didn't feel like there was a big enough shift. And I think that would have really helped the story be a better read. The layer of ice. It feels rough against my face, but not cold. I've got nothing to hold on to. My gloves just keep sliding off, and I can see people on top running around, but they can't do anything. I'm trying to pound the ice with my fists, but my arms move in slow motion, and my lungs must have burst, and my head's going fuzzy, and I feel like I'm dissolving. I wake up, screaming. Before I only remembered falling through the ice, the doctor said my mind had suppressed the rest. It was so real, I could feel it. Feel what it was like to die. It was the first time in the hospital I'd ever tried their new drug on someone with so much brain damage. Did it work? Well, that's a hell of an opening scene right there. I think that that really hooked me, hooked me good. And I say for about 50% of the story, I was I was invested. I, I was interested where this was going to, to go, uh, what kind of commentary this, this story was was trying to deliver to us. But it got a little bit tiring. Let me know what you, you felt in the comments down below. Uh, the same nightmare again and again. So this guy is having a nightmare. He's had a very traumatic uh, injury of some kind. He has brain damage, and they're trying to... Um, Give him this drug to, to rehabilitate him. I drive into downtown Boston after half hour. Dr. Hooper can see me. Did you ever have any before the accident, Leon? Never. Uh, are these a side effect of the drugs? Not a side effect. The hormone K-therapy regenerated a lot of damage in neurons. Okay, repeat this number. 3917462. What? 3917462. Use that number the first time you examined me. Do you remember the number from the second time I examined you? Most people can't retain so many digits if they've only heard them once. Do you use mnemonic tricks? So we can see this is the seed of, of his progress, right? Uh, his, his growing brain. I'm sitting in front of the terminal in one of the testing rooms in the psychiatric ward. Well, Leon, you did very well. On both tests, you scored in the 99th percentile. Well, clearly you've improved tremendously. A little of that may have come about naturally as you grew older, but most of it must be a result of the hormone K therapy. This is one hell of a side effect. Well, don't get too excited. Test scores don't predict how well you can do things in the real world. Well, we'll see. I'm in the middle of retouching a holograph when the phone rings. Hey, Leon, it's Jerry. You interested in seeing a movie tonight? Tonight? Uh, I can't. Tonight's the last performance of the one-woman show at the Hanging Pla 
Panning Playhouse. It's called Simpletic. It's a monologue in verse. It's a stream of consciousness piece and it alternates between four different meters, iambics only one of them, and all the critics call it a tour de force. It suddenly occurs to me what's just happened. I've never been able to do any serious editing while talking on the phone, but this time I had no trouble keeping my mind on both things at once. The thing I noticed was the increase in my reading speed and comprehension. And now I can find I can concentrate on two things at once. The neurologist in chief, Dr. Shea, has taken over my case, presumably because he wants to take credit. How do you feel about the increase in your intelligence? He asks. What an inane question. I'm very pleased about it. Good, says Dr. Shea. So far we've found no adverse effects in the hormone K therapy. You don't require any further treatment for the brain damage from your accident. However, we're conducting a study. If you're willing, we'd like to give you further injection of the hormone and then monitor the results. I'd be willing to do that. Has anyone been given additional injections before? Of course, you're not going to be a guinea pig. I can assure you there haven't been any harmful side effects. If Shay doesn't want to tell me about Hormone K, I can find out about it on my own. From my terminal at home, I log on to the data net. So it begins. Hormone K replaces only damaged neurons, not healthy ones. Stroke victims, sufferers of Alzheimer's, and persons like me in a persistent vegetative state. The animal studies don't shed any light on the increased intelligence in humans. The next question, is there a plateau? Or will additional dosages of the hormone cause further increases? I'm not nervous. In fact, I feel quite relaxed. I'm just lying on my stomach, breathing very slowly. My back is numb. They give me a local anesthetic and then injected the hormone K intraspinally. More nightmares. They're not actually violent, but the most bizarre, mind-blowing dreams I've ever had. There are several psychologists in the hospital studying me now. It's interesting to see how they analyze my intelligence. There's no point in denying it. I'm equally good at everything. I could be studying the new class of equation of the grammar of a foreign language or the operation of an engine in each case, everything fits together. All elements cooperate beautifully. In each case, I don't have to constantly memorize rules and then apply them mechanically. So he's seeing, he's learning differently. And I think that's probably the most interesting thing about the story is like when we're so aware of later in the story when he's talking about how he can, he can feel or he can, he can recognize the synapses in his brain, the blood, the nutrient absorption, all of this stuff. You're almost like stepping outside of your biology to agree and and it really is the shortcomings of the way we are physically with the way he's developing mentally. Penetrating computer security is really quite dull. Getting in the FDA's private database was easy. I broke out of the program to the system level, wrote a decoy program to mimic the opening screen. So this is when he's uh, stealing password information so he can log in. But of the patients originally in the deep coma states, I'm the only one thus far who's received a third injection. I've gained more new synapses than anyone previously studied. Playing with the doctors is becoming more and more tedious as the weeks go by. They treat me as if I were a simply an idiot savant, a patient who exhibits certain signs of high intelligence, but still just a patient. But consistently perfect scores don't tell them anything because they have no basis for comparison this far out of the bell curve. Of course, the test scores merely capture a shadow of the real challenge occurring. With patterns, I see the gestalt, the melody with the notes and everything, mathematics and science, art and music, psychology and sociology. So he's seeing the, uh, the, the big thing that is more than the sum of its parts, this, this thing that is going to uh, expand his knowledge even more. As glorious as these patterns are, they are also whet my appetite for more. I want this more than anything I've ever wanted before. Well, of course, right? I'm sure everyone would. The visiting doctor's name is Klaus, and he doesn't behave like the other doctors because he's not, right? He thinks he's a CIA agent. This test works this way, Leon. You'll read some descriptions of various situations. He's presenting a problem. After each one, I want you to tell me what you do to solve that problem. It's a problem of scheduling and prioritizing. Taste. I wait before giving my answer. The Klaus is still surprised at my speed. That's very good, Leon. Try this one. The scenario involves office politics, fierce competition. And this is when he realizes who Clausen is, a government psychologist, perhaps military, probably part of the CIA's Office of Research and Development. And I certainly don't want to become a CIA resource. The best I can do is to downplay my skills and get the question wrong. So that is exactly what he does. Clausen dismisses me when the test ends. If I'd shown my true abilities, the CIA would recruit me immediately. My situation has changed profoundly. When the CIA decides to retain me as a test subject, my consent will be purely optional. I must make plans. Things are accelerating. It's four days later and Shay's surprised. You want to withdraw from the study? Yes, effective immediately. I'm returning to work. If it's a matter of compensation, I'm sure we can't. No, I know how much you're learning from these tests. It doesn't change my decision. I don't wish to continue. Goodbye, Dr. Shea. It's two days later when Dr. Shea calls. Leon, you have to come in for an examination. 
I've just been informed adverse side effects have been found in the patients treated with hormone K at another hospital. What sort of side effects? Loss of vision, there's excessive growth of the optic nerve followed by deterioration. And of course, the CIA must have ordered this when they heard that I'd withdrawn from the study. I'll come down right away. Hang up and turn on my terminal to check the latest information in the FDA database. There's no mention of any adverse effects on the optic nerve or anywhere else. It's time to leave Boston. And he's working a couple hours. The phone rings again. And then Shay calls, wondering where he is. I'll try call, calling one more time, and then I'll send the orderlies with the white suits or perhaps the actual police to pick me up. 7.30 p.m., Shay is still in the hospital waiting for the news about me. Any moment now, he will notice the envelope I slipped under the door in his office. Greetings, Dr. Shay. I imagine you're looking for me. You can call off those burly orderlies who are waiting at my apartment. I don't want to waste their valuable time. You're probably determined to have the police issue an APB on me, though. Therefore, I've taken the liberty of inserting a virus in the DMV computer that will substitute information whenever my license plate number is requested. Of course, you could give me a description of my car, but you don't even know what it's like, do you, Leon? I'll call the police now their programmers work on the virus, but Shay will be mistaken, though. These actions are designed to make the police and CIA, CIA underestimate me so I can rely on their not taking adequate precautions. This will activate a second virus. My next goal is to get another ampule of hormone, hormone K. Of course, he's got to power up. Meanwhile, I've checked in the hotel and I'm working out of a room's data net terminal. I've broken into the private database of the FDA. I've seen the addresses of the hormone K subjects and the internal communications of the FDA. The FDA has asked all the hospitals to return the remaining ampules by courier. I must get an ampule before this happens. I'm parked in a rental car just around the corner from a skyscraper in Pittsburgh. There's a van, Pennsylvania courier, printed on the side. It's just come from the hospital. Last night, I penetrated the service database for Lucas Security Systems. There, I found an encrypted file containing the codes to override their locks. I tap in a 12-digit number, and the locker door swings open. With the ampule on my belongings, I drive to New York City. The fastest way for me to make money is, oddly enough, gambling, of course, right? You can see all the patterns. As my mind develops, so does my control over my body. While my strength hasn't increased, my coordination is now well above average. I'm even becoming ambidextrous. After comparatively little practice, I'm able to raise or lower my heart rate and blood pressure. So he's having full bodily control, mind over matter to a degree. I rewrite a program to perform a pattern match of photos of my face and search for occurrences of my name. The CIA will have the National Data Net News Briefs display my picture and identify me as a dangerously insane escape patient, perhaps a murderer. The virus will replace my photo with video static. I'll keep track of the, the other patients in case the government decides to recruit them. The Quitodian Pattern Society are revealed without my making any effort. So he's starting to just see how everything works. To me, these people seem like children on a playground. He is ascending. He is becoming so smart that everything you know that we know becomes meaningless to a degree. I acquire years of education each week, assembling ever larger patterns. I'm writing part of an extended poem as an experiment. Interesting that he's going toward the arts. I'm employing six modern and four ancient languages. They include most of the significant worldviews of human civilization. Each one provides different shades of meaning and poetic effects. The CIA interrupts my work. They're baiting a trap for me. The news services report that the girlfriend of the deranged murder has been charged with aiding and abetting. So they're trying to use this girl that he dated at one time to capture him. I begin editing the first image on screen. The photos taken yesterday show the exterior of Connie's apartment building. So he's fixing things up. I mark six locations all together and they indicate where the CIA agents are watching last night. Once I finish, I transmit the images to the director of the CIA. I could kill his undercover agents at any time unless they withdrew. Pattern recognition again. Thousands of pages, reports, memos, correspondences, watching for lines and edges to emerge to create a pattern. What I found is rather ordinary. The director of the CIA was aware of a terrorist group planned to bomb the Washington, D.C. metro system. Let the bombing occur in order to gain congressional approval for the use of extreme measures against that group. So collateral damage, right, just to um, catch the bigger fish. I send the list of memos to the director of the CIA with a note. Don't bother me, and I won't bother you. By now, I could walk on hot coals and stick needles in my arm. Designing a new language. Here we are. So this, to me was very reminiscent of the stories of your life or the movie Arrival in that uh, the language that they have to decipher or the language that is used, like, it's 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 symbols, but then, like, it also spans time. I don't think it quite gets here in this story, but it's something beyond human comprehension. He finds that uh, our languages are far too simplistic to um, do the things he needs to do. 
that makes me think that I mean this could have been like the fr- the framework or the groundwork for um, uh, the ideas behind that next story. After I've translated all that I know from this language, the patterns I seek should become evident. I must establish a vocabulary for all emotions I can imagine. I'm aware of many emotions beyond those of a normal human. Interesting to think that there are more emotions. I do see them for what they were, like the infatuations and desperations of childhood. They were just the forerunners of what I experience now. Of course, I actually experience far fewer emotions than I could. My development is limited by the intelligence of those around me. Confucian concept of Ren, inadequately conveyed by benevolence, that quality which is quintessentially human, which can only be cultivated through interaction with others and with which a solitary person cannot manifest. So this is an interesting concept. and I, I like how Chang kind of brings historical things or, or science concepts or anything like that into his stories. I'm clearly science. But here he kind of merges philosophy or, or religion or whatever, things from the arts into uh science. And so it's saying that something in isolation cannot develop in a way that a social organism can. So that's kind of cool to think about. So, hey, kids, get outside, go outside, talk to people. My new language is taking shape. It's a gestalt oriented, uh, rendering it beautifully suited for thought, but in practice, I like saying that word gestalt, but in practical for writing speech, it wouldn't be transcribed in the form of words arranged linearly was a giant ideogram to be absorbed as a whole. So more symbolic than um, phonetic characters, he is simplifying things, kind of like almost Chinese characters or kanji, right? Where it's symbols kind of represent the idea of something or or I guess a sign, it might be the same thing. My mind sees with expletives from ancient modern languages and, and they taunt me with their crudeness, reminding me that my ideal language would offer terms with sufficient venom to express my present frustration. I cannot complete my artificial language. It's too large for a project for my present tools. What about my fourth ampule? I can't remove it from my thoughts. Of course, there are significant risks. This injection might be the one that causes brain damage or insanity. Or equipment from the medical supply company and assemble an apparatus for administering the spinal injection by myself. I inject myself and wait. My brain is on fire. My spine burns itself through my back. I feel near apoplexy. I am blind, deaf, insensate. I hallucinate. For a brief moment, perception returns. Convulsions have left my body badly bruised and a concussion is likely given the continuations on the back of my head but i feel nothing has it been hours or moments then my vision clouds and the roar returns critical mass it's interesting how he separated these with dotted lines like it's computer code or something revelation which i guess is appropriate for what's going to happen next i understand the mechanism of my own thinking i know precisely how i know my understanding is recursive i understand the infinite regress of this self-knowing not by proceeding step by step endlessly but apprehending the limit fiat logos i know my mind in terms of a language more expressive than i'd previously imagined like god creating order from chaos with an utterance i make myself anew with this language not only can it describe thought it can describe and modify its own operations as well at all levels with this language i can now see my mind operating this is what I was talking about earlier, how it's crazy how you're almost stepping outside of yourself, right? You're this physical being, but you can see the workings, uh, you know, where I know we're all made of, you know, electrical impulses and stuff and, and cells and nutrients flowing about, you know, unbeknownst to us, but to, to see it and perceive it and feel it and, and, and know exactly what's happening at all times, that's, that's kind of hard to wrap your head around. What I can do is perceive the gestalts. I see the mental structures forming, interacting. It is hours before I can control the flood of self-describing information. I recognize all this causes my every mood and the motives behind my every decision. What can I do with this knowledge? I understand the mechanisms that were operating when I attended to two tasks at once. I can divide my consciousness. Now it's getting really freaking crazy. Simultaneously devoting almost full concentration and gestalt gestalt recognition uh, abilities to two or more separate problems. Meta aware of all them. What can't I do? I know my body afresh as if I were an amputee stump suddenly replaced by a watchmaker's hand. I have somatic awareness of kidney function, nutrient absorption, glandular secretions. I'm even conscious of the role that neurotransmitters play in my thoughts. I'm closing in on the ultimate gestalt, the context in which all knowledge fits and is illuminated. A mandala, a music of the spheres, a cosmos. I've sighted my final destination, starting with a martial arts training. So he's going full Neo in the Matrix right now. I think someone on the Discord said this uh, story was written in 1991, and The Matrix came out in 1991, so, hmm, hmm. Hypothesize what that means in the comments below. I shall also shave my scalp, interesting, so he's turning to Morpheus now, to allow greater radiative cooling for the heightened blood flow in my head. Then there is the primary goal, decoding those patterns. For further improvements to my mind, artificial enhancements are the only possibility. I've gone to the outside world to reobserve a society 
The sign language of emotion I once knew has been replaced by a matrix of matrix <laughs> of interrelated equations. At the moment, I'm sitting in a bar. Three stools to my right sits a man. I don't need to listen to know what he's saying. A compulsive liar. My sensitivity to the body language of the others has increased to the point that I can make these observations without sight or sound. That's pretty crazy. Normal humans may detect these emanations subliminally. I've developed abilities reminiscent of the mind control schemes offered by tabloid advertisements. I can cause another person to respond with anger, fear, sympathy, or sexual arousal, certainly enough to win friends and influence people. Dale Carnegie quote, interesting. I can no longer dream in any normal sense. I understand how my mind generates the strange visions, but I'm paralyzed and unable to, to respond. Yeah, I think that would drive you mad, right? I mean, being aware of all this, it's kind of like Dr. Manhattan from Watchmen. It's just... Um, he feels so out of place because he experiences everything at the same time. I'm hallucinating. I see my mind imagining possible configurations it would assume and then collapsing. I witness my own delusions, my visions of what form my mind might take when I grasp the ultimate gestalt. <laughs> That's hard to say after a while, especially this late. Will I achieve ultimate self-awareness? Perhaps I would see the soul, the ingredient of consciousness that surprise, surpasses physicality. Proof of God? My mind collapses back into a state of sanity. I must keep a tighter rein over myself. I open my eyes. It's two hours, 28 minutes, and 10 seconds since I close my eyes to rest, though not to sleep. I rise from bed. I look down the flat screen and freeze. The screen shouts at me. It tells me that there is another person with an enhanced mind. Oh, my God. Five of my investments have demonstrated losses. C-E-G-O and R, which rearranged spelled Greco. Someone is sending me a message. There's someone else out there like me. Of course, he's got to have a... He's got to have an antagonist, right? He too stole another ampule of the hormone contributing to the FDA's closing of their files and with the whereabouts unknown to the authorities, he's reached my level. Presumably his treatment began before mine did, meaning that he is farther along than I. But by how much? Critical question. Is he friend or foe? I pick a city at random, Memphis. I switch off the flat screen, get dressed, pack a travel bag, and collect all the emergency cash in the apartment. The first thing I do is reroute my activities through several dummy term terminals. An alarm program at the Houston terminal will alert me if someone has successfully traced me there. This is when we find out his name is Reynolds, and he's originally from Phoenix, and his early progress closely parallels mine. He received his third injection six months and four days ago, giving him a head start over me by 15 days. He didn't erase any of the obvious records. He waits for me to find him. I estimate that he's been super critical for 12 days, twice as long as I've been. I'm using two single-hand keyboards and a throat mic so I can work on three queries simultaneously. His location is Philadelphia. He waits for me to arrive. I'm riding in a mud splatter taxi at Reynolds' apartment. His private research involves bioengineered micro microorganisms for toxic waste disposal, inertial containment for practical fusion, and subliminal dissemination of information through societies of various structures. You know, I feel like the <laughs> the writing is is kind of reflecting his his who he is now, right? So, uh, I'll, I'll go back on that original comment a little bit. I feel like uh, now reading it this quickly and going through it, you can kind of see that that progression. But he plans to save the world. Show no interest in the affairs of the external world. So, in fact, he's kind of the villain, right? This Reynolds guy is more of the hero. I, I view the world as incidental to my aims, while he cannot allow someone with enhanced intelligence to work purely in self-interest. Both of us have dispensed with several rounds of games. There are a thousand ways we could have attempted to kill each other, from painting neurotoxin-laced DMSO on a doorknob to ordering surgical strike from a military kill sat. The taxi stops. I pay the driver and walk up to the apartment building. The door to Reynolds' apartment is also open. I walk down the doorway to the living room, hearing the hyper-accelerated polyphony from a digital synthesizer. There's a large swivel chair in the room, its back turned toward me. Reynolds is not visible. He's restricting his somatic emanations to comatose levels. I imply my presence and recognition of his identity. And we talk in code here, right? Because this is telling us that they're not speaking aloud. It's some other weird form of communication in their, in their weird language they've developed. Reynolds, acknowledgement, Greco. To communicate, we're exchanging fra fragments from the somatic language of the normals, a shorthand version of the vernacular. Okay. A shame it must be as enemies. Indeed, imagine how we could have changed this world acting in concert. It's kind of funny. It, to me, this this whole exchange feels a little cheesy, um, like almost someone is making fun of, of a story like this and offer. Do you wish to share what we've learned in the past six months? He knows what my answer is. Many minutes pass. I learned much from him, and he from me. Reynolds has witnessed the beauty that I have. He stood before lovely insights, oblivious to them. The, the soul gestalt that inspires him 
is the one I ignored, that of the planetary society, of the biosphere. I am a lover of beauty, he of humanity. Each feels that the other has ignored great opportunity. He has an unmentioned plan for establishing a global network of influence to create world prosperity. What motivates him is not simply compassion or altruism, but something that entails both of these things. What about the beauty visible from enlightenment? Doesn't it attract you? You know what kind of structure would be required to hold an enlightened consciousness? There is no point in further discussion. By mutual assent, we begin. It's meaningless to speak of element of surprise when we time our attacks. Our awareness can't become more acute with forewarning. It increases blood pressure rapidly and enormously. So that's honestly kind of scary how you can control that kind of aspect. So they're they're not physically fighting, even though he taught himself martial arts, man. Why isn't he doing the kung fu? Reynolds detects it immediately, and he reduces his heart rate and dilates the blood vessels. So counterattack, but it's the other subtler re reinforcing loop that is my real attack. This loop causes the neurons to dramatically overproduce neurotransmitter antagonists, preventing impulses from crossing its synapses, shutting down brain activity. I've been radiating this loop at a much higher intensity than the other. Once his brain function has been reduced to the level of normal, I should be able to manipulate his mind easily. Reynolds is in equilibrium. I'm stunned. He was able to break the reinforcement loop. He has stopped the most sophisticated offensive I could mount. Within seconds, Reynolds is fully restored. They're very robotic here, but, you know, I guess that makes sense. He acknowledges my skill. A very interesting technique, appropriate, given your self-absorption. I saw indication when, abruptly, he projects a different somatic signature, one that I recognize. He used it when he walked behind me at the grocery store three days ago. The aisle was crowded. Around me were an old woman wheezing behind her and a thin teenager on an acid trip wearing a liquid crystal shirt, shifting psychedelic patterns. Ooh, that's the key, right? Uh, Reynolds slipped behind me, his mind on the porn mag stands. His surveillance didn't have form of my reinforcing loops, but it did permit a more detailed picture of my mind, a possibility I anticipated. I reformulate my psyche, incorporating random elements for unpredictability. I project the equivalent of a smile. Reynolds smiles back. Have you ever considered? Suddenly projects only silence. He's about to speak, but I can't predict what. Then it comes as a whisper. Self-destruct commands, Greco. He needs the word proper noun. The sense is that when uttered would destroy the mind of the listener. Reynolds is claiming that the myth is true, that every mind is such a trigger built in, that for every person there is a sentence that can reduce him to an idiot, a lunatic, a catatonic, and he's claiming he knows the one for me. Then I conceive a simulator on my own consciousness to receive the input and absorb it at a reduced speed. I get everything in place by the time Reynolds has finished saying my name. His next sentence could be the destruct command. Meanwhile, I give my response lightly, casually. Don't worry, it's not on the tip of my tongue. Reynolds knows that I've built my defenses. Is his trigger command designed to circumvent them? What are you waiting for? Try to guess. So smug. Have you used the destruct command on normals? Once on a, as an experiment on a drug dealer. Afterward, I concealed the evidence with a blow to the temple. In a hysteronic gesture. Hysteronic, interesting word. Reynolds raises his hand, forefinger extended, as if to make a point. With his finger up raised, he says, understand. There's a title. <laughs> First I don't, and then I horrifyingly do. He didn't design the command to be spoken. It's not a sensory trigger at all. It's a memory trigger. The command is made out of a string of perceptions, individually harmless, that he planted in my brain like time bombs. Immediately, my mind is working faster than before. Milliseconds pass. My death passes before my eyes. No time. All I can do is metaprogram myself over randomly at a furious pace. I tear apart my psyche, but still the conclusion grows clear, the resolution sharper. I concede his greater ingenuity. It bodes well for his endeavor. I wonder what he intends to do after he saved the world. I comprehend the word and the means by which it operates, and so I dissolve. I don't know. Um, it was kind of interesting, I guess. There's some cool stuff in there about, um, to contemplate anyway, like when you are so smart that you're almost separate from your biology, right? Everything doesn't make sense anymore. It's very Dr. Manhattan, like I said, from Watchmen. Cool stuff to think about. To me, it just felt far too extended. I will retract my comment about the writing not really reflecting his his advancement because going through it this quickly, it took me a couple days to get through the story. And so I was so separated from it, I, I might not have noticed it as well. But at this cadence, I did notice it. So pretend it never happened. But let me know, what are you thinking of these two stories so far? I'll say that they are intriguing a little bit. The ideas there behind the stories, I, I wouldn't say that I'm 
invested in these stories like I like to be invested in the, in stories when I read with characters, with, with plots, with ups and downs. It's just kind of ideas, right? He's just trying to give us ideas, which maybe that is why he gets all this credit and it's not so much for his you know characterization or his plot work or, or, or anything like that, but it's it's really just taking these concepts and putting them into a narrative form and facilitating thought, I guess, and pondering these things. But I guess for next week, we shall read the next two stories, which is Division by Zero and Story of Your Life, the famous one that is um, the one that the film Arrival is based on. So thanks for watching. Thanks for hanging out with me. Don't forget to let me know what you're thinking so far in the comments, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.